Welcome back everyone, I'm Jordan Giesecke and this is The Limiting Factor. This is the first of three videos on QuantumScape, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We're going to start with the ugly, which is the short seller report by Scorpion Capital claiming that QuantumScape is an outright fraud. I'm going to walk you through the seven ways in which that report was misleading. To save you the time of watching the full video, in my opinion, the Scorpion report is one you can file directly to the trash. That's not to say I don't have reservations about QuantumScape, but rather, my opinion is that there are so many half-truths, falsehoods, misinterpretations, and such a biased slant that the report is rendered useless from an investing lens. Before we begin, a special thanks to my Patreon supporters and YouTube members. This is the support that gives me the freedom to avoid chasing the algorithm and sponsors, and I hope will eventually allow me to do this full time. As always, the links for support are in the description. Back to QuantumScape. The Scorpion Report is 188 pages long and it contains a lot of repetition. I've picked seven examples that pretty well encapsulate what's repeated throughout the report. I'm not going to get into the parts of the document that are pure speculation or financial. As much as possible, I'm going to stick with the technical. Let's start with an example of taking information out of context. The report says that QuantumScape cherry-picked their tests, and that the use of a symmetric cell is proof of this. They quote Jeff Don's website as saying that symmetric cells are, quote, useless from a practical point of view, unquote, although they can provide other significant information. If we look at the original web page that they took that information from, which is linked at the bottom of the slide, it's a web page talking about why symmetric cells are so valuable for researchers. The full sentence is, Although the cells have an average voltage of zero volts and are useless from a practical point of view, they can give vast information about reactions between electrode materials and electrolyte. Without getting into the weeds here, a full cell is the term used to describe batteries that have different material on the cathode and anode, which generates voltage. Symmetric cells are lab cells where the cathode and anode are made of the same material allowing the electrolyte to be the target of the test. In any experiment, you need a control, and that's what a symmetric cell does. It gives information about the electrolyte by controlling for the cathode and anode. Furthermore, symmetric cells typically use pure lithium metal on both the cathode and anode. What's the main difference between a conventional battery versus a solid-state battery like QuantumScape's? The solid electrolyte and the pure lithium metal anode. What did we just say the two key features of a symmetric cell are? It targets the electrolyte and uses pure lithium metal on not just the anode, but also the cathode. This is why in this specific slide, QuantumScape used a symmetric cell. They ran a test at increasing power to stress test their solid electrolyte and prove that it resists dendrites. Dendrites are growths of pure lithium metal that occur when a battery is charging and discharging. If they grow tall enough, they can pierce the solid electrolyte between the cathode and anode, shorting out the battery. The more power you push through a cell during charge and discharge, the more likely it is that dendrites form. In other words, the test is an appropriate test to show resistance to dendrites. I'd also be interested in seeing data that shows not only charging, but discharging, to find out how the cell reacts to the stress test when the current is reversed. However, this is more out of curiosity than necessity. To summarize, Scorpion took a positive sentence from the Don Research Group website, underlined the part that suited their narrative, shortened and paraphrased the positive words, then applied the skewed logic to QuantumScape's use of a symmetric cell. However, QuantumScape's choice of test was appropriate, if not overkill, for the purposes of the presentation. I say overkill because it's a stress test that the general public and short sellers didn't understand. This slide showing full cell data is more appropriate. The fact that QuantumScape provided the performance of a full cell for over 800 cycles is evidence that not only does the cell resist dendrites, it does so with a functional battery cell. This test doesn't require any specialty knowledge to understand, and it's actually better proof of dendrite resistance. Next, let's look at an example of exaggeration by Scorpion. CellPress has a form called Standardized Data Reporting for Batteries. Alexandra K. Stefan, scientific editor at Joule, did a nice write-up to show how this form came about. 
The short story is that the purpose of the form is to standardize the information required for articles in the Cell Press Journal, improve transparency, and improve reproducibility. If you look at the form itself, it says that authors are encouraged to complete the form as supplemental information, and that not doing so may slow down the peer review process. This makes sense because the form tells the reviewers if the manuscript contains the information that they're looking for. And if not, why not? I can relate. It frustrates the hell out of me when a key piece of information is missing from a journal article with no explanation as to why. In other words, the cell press form is like any checklist. It's to make sure you don't forget things that are useful and important. What does Scorpion Capital say this form is? They say the form is to prevent fraud, the information requested is a minimum for publication and credibility, and an oath of honesty. That's far from the cell press form's actual purpose, which is to improve their peer review process and the quality of information in their articles. Even better, the cell press checklist wasn't published until January 2021, one month after QuantumScape's presentation. So, unless QuantumScape has a TARDIS, there's no way they could have completed this form a month before it was published. In the next slide, Scorpion is trying to apply common sense, but they end up just showing how shallow their knowledge of battery science is. Unfortunately, with batteries, common sense almost never applies. One of the QuantumScape graphs shows the energy going above 100%. Scorpion's solid-state expert claims this is a trick, and that they manipulated the underlying data. Let's look at how their solid-state expert is misinterpreting the data. QuantumScape has stated that they benchmark 100% capacity to the first cycle after the formation step. Formation is charging and discharging the battery, and it's part of the manufacturing process. After formation, the energy capacity of QuantumScape's batteries tends to increase just a bit due to stabilization of the interfaces between the cathode, anode, and electrolyte. In other words, after the battery's broken in, its performance increases. This can happen in liquid electrolyte batteries as well, but for different reasons. So yes, it's common to see battery cells going above the 100% mark, and it's expected for QuantumScape cells. This is a well-known phenomenon, and not a trick. Let's look at a claim of outright fraud by Scorpion. They claim this is fake data. Their reasoning is that because QuantumScape's data in blue appears to be flawless in comparison to the conventional battery cell in gray, that QuantumScape's data must be fraudulent because it's too perfect. When a battery is charged, the battery should charge at a constant rate, and if the charge data is sampled at a constant interval, it creates a perfect graph. So the question that should be asked of this graph is, why is the data from the conventional battery cell more intermittent? Note that the actual slope of the line is smooth, indicating that the charge rate is smooth. However, it appears that the data wasn't sampled at a constant rate. I say this because although the line is a smooth arc, there's compression and gaps between the data points. This means the data may have come from different testing equipment. I contacted QuantumScape, and they confirmed that the data in the blue line for their cell was from their own testing equipment, and the data in the gray line was from a third-party source and was of a Tesla on a supercharger. I'm satisfied with that response because it can fully explain the variation in data between the lines simply and cleanly. Next, the Scorpion report leaned heavily on anonymous sources like former employees. I have a hard time putting faith in these claims for several reasons. The claims of those former employees could have been compromised in several ways because, among other things, they typically received compensation. Second, as we saw a moment ago, Scorpion's experts don't appear to have a good grasp on solid-state technology, so how can we trust that the employees they consulted know what they're talking about? Unfortunately, there's no way to know about these first two. But some of the former employee claims can be vetted somewhat. In the claim on screen, an employee is saying that QuantumScape was producing a lot of scrap when he or she worked there. If an employee left QuantumScape more than two years ago, QuantumScape would be in a dramatically different stage of development than they are now. A lot of what the former employee said is exactly what's expected at bench scale. At bench scale, a startup is just trying to get a product, process, or material to work. This can take thousands of iterations, and 99% or more of those iterations would be a technical failure but are inherent in development. 
particularly in battery development. For example, Sila Nano went through 35,000 iterations before they landed on something that worked. That's roughly 15 to 20 cells a day for the 8 years it took Sila to develop their chemistry. That's a 99.9999% failure rate. After a startup has landed on what material they're going to use, they can start building in more automation. With automation comes precision, and with precision, fewer scrap cells and waste. QuantumScape is primarily developing new materials and should be able to leverage existing manufacturing processes. This means that once QuantumScape optimizes their material, they should be able to move from bench scale to lab scale within a year or two compared to what may have been several years for Maxwell DBE. A pilot line is a different story altogether and will take several years, but bench scale to lab scale can happen rapidly if off-the-shelf equipment is available. Currently, QuantumScape is at a lab scale because they haven't yet built a pilot line. I don't have information about how long they've been at lab scale, but I suspect they moved to lab scale recently given that they only appear to have finalized their solid state material in the last year or two. How long ago did this specific employee of the five employees Scorpion cited work at QuantumScape? I suspect it's more than two years ago given what they're describing. This means we can throw out most of what that employee said to Scorpion. They were describing what we'd expect from a bench scale process. In fact, I'm left impressed more than anything. If QuantumScape was building 300 cells a day, it sounds like they were using serious brute force to crack the solid state problem. The employee states that of those 300, few were okay to test. Why would so few of the cells be candidates for testing? Solid state electrolytes like the one QuantumScape is using are brittle. Any microscopic cracks in this material would result in the test cell failing. With manual handling and little to no automation, it's no surprise that many of the cells would fail. How many is difficult to know, and it's also hard to know if the employee here was exaggerating when he or she said few. Regardless, it's no basis to question whether QuantumScape can build 100,000 engineering samples a year with a fully automated line in 2023. Those 100,000 cells would need to be usable cells, but it's only 400 cells per day. That's peanuts compared to gigafactories which pump out millions of cells per day. Next, the Scorpion report claims red flags where there's actually no red flag. In this slide, Scorpion claims that QuantumScape is hiding something because they're using different charge and discharge rates in different slides. In other words, they're saying that QuantumScape should have shown a cycle life slide using QuantumScape's maximum 15-minute charge rate. This is a strange expectation if we put it in the context of ICE vehicles. The 15-minute charge time is a maximum performance figure. The 800 cycles is an expected durability figure. Let's say a legacy auto company claimed their vehicle could do 0 to 60 in 4 seconds and also provided a warranty on the engine of 240,000 miles. Could you rightly expect that the vehicle would last 240,000 miles if all those miles were logged on a drag strip doing 4 second 0 to 60 runs? That's an easy no. Moving along, there's a bonus point on this slide. Scorpion claims that QuantumScape is burying things in the fine print, which is the pot calling the kettle black and not even accurate. This is a normal sized font when we look at the original slide. In fact, the way the information is presented in this graph is actually more clear than I've seen in most research papers. This is what burying things in the fine print looks like. A full page of block font that contains gems like, the quotations of experts do not reflect certain positive comments and experiences. The experts have typically received compensation for their conversations with us and may have conflicts of interest or other biases. The former employees and the information they have provided may be outdated. The quotations may be paraphrased and or summarized at our discretion and do not always represent a precise transcript of those conversations. In other words, the quotations Scorpion provided were selected for negative bias, the transcripts may have been altered, most of the informants were paid, the information possibly outdated, and the informants may have had a bone to pick with QuantumScape. In summary, if you're looking for insights into what's happening at QuantumScape, you can learn more by looking at what's wrong with the QuantumScape report rather than what's right. 
The seven examples illustrated in this video were just a sample platter, and I can do the same with most of the rest of the 188-page document. Scorpion is a short seller. All too often, short sellers make their living off of developing a negative narrative around a company, with no regard for the lives of the people they're affecting, while doing it under the banner of a healthy, free market. That's not all short sellers, but unfortunately, it happens enough that you question the utility of short selling and its role in markets. In this case, in my opinion, the purpose of the Scorpion Report wasn't to inform, it was to manipulate. In the next video, we'll look at the bad, which, in my view, is the ways in which QuantumScape fumbled the ball in terms of their communications strategy. Regardless of whether QuantumScape's materials-level discovery breaks through to customer products, it's already being treated as a victory, which I view is premature. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me on Patreon with the link at the end of the video. I'm also active on Twitter. You can find the details in the description, and I look forward to hearing from you. A special thanks to Eric Doster, Paul Meyer, Thomas Bloom, and Cesar Escamilla for your generous support of the channel, my YouTube members, and all the other patrons listed in the credits. I appreciate all your support, and thanks for tuning in.